Good morning. Good morning. So, some 800 days ago, I was hit by a car, left in the street with a broken elbow. And after my savings were exhausted paying for it, I was asked to buy $400 in textbooks by a department paying me a little over a thousand bucks a month. While I was searching for textbooks, Amazon recommended a cheap, capable camera to me. And I had a flash of insight. Cameras were cheaper than textbooks. And so I did what I always do when I get in trouble. I jumped in a dumpster, got some boards and junk, and bodged together a book scanner. The damn thing worked so well that I shared the plans online as a 79-step instructor. And since that time, over a thousand people have joined me in developing this technology, starting with two programmers, two mechanical engineers, and an intellectual property lawyer. Among the first people to contact me was Surya a village official in Indonesia. He wanted to build a copy of the scanner, but he didn't have money for cameras. We donated some cameras to him, and he built the scanner out of junk and digitized these moldy, water, fire, and flood damaged holy books. Among the other people to join the project were Misty DeMeo, who brought DIY book scanning technology to a library setting to overcome limited funding. Rob, the co-founder of the forum, is working on scanning his 2,000 science fiction paperbacks when he's not building steam-powered computers. Tristan, a mechanical engineering major who has trouble reading with his eyes, built the scanner to have his computer read for him. And Ben Barati built a book, sc uh, book scanning system to help create the Durationator, which is a system that checks if it's legal to copy a book. It's a project at Tulane University. We have even more ambitious projects. Uh, PostScan Grinder has scanned 36,000 pages of yearbooks in exchange for the rights to put them online. And from Maritime Heritage Minnesota is digitizing ships' logs from a landlocked state. <laughs> I mostly scanned my own textbooks, which was fortunate because the building I work in collapsed, causing me to drop out of my graduate program. Uh, most recently, the Leave a Little Room Foundation uh, is using DIY book scanner technology in Leo Dan Haiti, and Dr. Joe and Dr. Pam are using DIY book scanner technology to digitize medical records and protect their earthquake troubled hospital. All these people, when given the means to better control their cameras, took the technologies and directions that I never anticipated from the bottom of that fateful dumpster in Fargo, North Dakota. And they made their own respective worlds better places to live. So I'm standing in front of you as a first-hand witness of the ways that cheap cameras, really cheap cameras, can change the world. <clears throat> so, cheap cameras. The fact of the matter is they're not always going to change the world in the way we want them to. And we need to go forward with that in mind to make the best use of their power. DIY Book Scanner, among other projects, was a transformative moment and existence proof of the power of cheap cameras to liberate information and to enable people to better help themselves and help others on their own terms. I helped start this thing and I felt a real responsibility to it. I started noticing cheap cameras all around me and being something of a hacker, I started ripping them apart, reading about them, and studying their innards to get closer to their hardware, to get closer to the essence of their power. And as I went deeper and deeper, uh, I found some things that really surprised me, and that's what I want to talk to you about today. So as it turns out, cheap cameras, like this one, which is the Pioneer phone, are cheap. They don't produce the same kind of images that SLRs produce, and they don't even work on the same principles. As it turns out, the cheaper a camera is, the harder it is to control, but the greater effect it is likely to have. So because this is a talk about cameras, I want to start with the beginnings of photography, the popularization of photography. Think for a moment about the 1900s, the 1930s, the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, even the 80s, the 90s, and the present day. And what you should see here is that cameras have always defined the aesthetic of our memories. Paul Simon said this best, Kodachrome, you give us these nice bright colors, you give us the greens of summers, and make us think all the world's a sunny day. Old cameras were, in a way, direct. You had an object in the world, a lens, and a piece of film. And the lens makes an image of the object on the film. Susan Sontag called this a stencil off the reel. It's pretty evocative. And as Mr. Simon pointed out, the film chemistry itself had an effect on the color of the image. And since those early days, photographs have become the basis of our memories. With each generation of photographic technology, we saw a different memory aesthetic emerge. And more so, as time has gone on, the aging of these photographs has in turn aged our memory of those times. It's never been more clearly evident than right now 
when the evidence, when the ad, with the advent of programs like Tipstamatic and Instagram for iPhones, which allow you to prematurely add these same technical defects to a photograph to give it a particular emotional feeling. And so in short, in the same way that typography and printing limitations give us cues to an era, the photographic technological limitations define our memory of a certain time, like a, a visual prosody. So back to the present moment. Cheap cameras are everywhere. You almost certainly have one in your pocket. And what's the most common camera in the world? It's not the camera in your phone. It's not your point and shoot. It's the camera in your mouse. The most common camera in the world stares at your filthy mouse pad all day. And the crazy thing <laughs> about that camera is that it doesn't even output a picture. It outputs a motion vector. Digital cameras can be crazy like that. Another thing that was surprising to me is that a silicon sensor, like the one in your phone, compact camera, or mouse, doesn't see color. In fact, silicon is relatively colorblind. And so a guy named Bayer invented a silicon camera in order to see, uh, invented a way for silicon cameras to see color. Over each pixel, there's a red, or a green, or a blue little stained glass window. And the stained glass window tells each pixel only how red it is, only how blue it is, or only how green it is. And to guess the full color at that pixel, you have to look at the pixels around it. And the nature of that guess is not really based on math. It's based on something unusual, especially in these very cheap cameras. It's based on consumer preference. By that I mean, excuse me, you can choose any value you want. But what camera companies do is have a focus group, look at a big mess of images, and say which ones they like best. And people, unsurprisingly perhaps, choose images with greener, more saturated grass, and less cyan skies. And so instead of color being yoked to film chemistry, as it was in the past, or to reality, as it is in our imagination, it's now being yoked to what best sells a camera. And these transforms between input and output are done in a little computer inside your camera, which is called the image signal processor. And it happens well before the image is ever saved to the car. And in this way, the film camera is to the digital camera like a typewriter is to a computer. And that's important because before we had a lens and we had film. And now we have a lens, a sensor, a mess of computational stuff you have no control over, and then a picture. And so what's going on here? The main intention is to sell more cameras. If the camera takes a picture that you like better, or a picture that you expected, you're more likely to pick it up off the shelf and take it home. And the problem with these very, very cheap cameras, like the one in your phone, which are being embedded in everything, is that they take awful pictures by economic necessity. The sensors are tiny and they're noisy because the pixels are so small. And the microscopic plastic lenses have trouble resolving detail. So if you look with the direct output, just the light that fell on the sensor, you see a noisy, ugly mess. And that's not something that sells well. Manufacturers want to reduce the cost of cameras as much as possible. So the camera industry has resorted to internal software corrections that are tied to the optics. The optics, the sensor, and the software all work together so that more information can be recovered later and to hide manufacturing defects and yield problems like dead pixels. So in a way, they make the images worse predictably to make them better and to eliminate expensive moving parts like autofocus motors. And as I previously mentioned, the images from these sensors are processed such that the grass appears greener. They're processed such that the skies appear bluer, and they are processed to appear sharper than they really are. And what's wild is that that's only the very beginning of this processing. <clears throat> Camera manufacturers have realized that mo people were most often taking pictures of people, and that in portrait photography, faces should always be in focus. So they implemented face detection, and then smile detection, and Sony took it to its ultimate conclusion, a camera that won't take a picture unless everyone is smiling. <laughs> <laughs> HP, not to be outdone, released a suite of cameras that will slim you by 10%. <laughs> Available today on Amazon. Test Sarah, who sells their image signal processors to five of 10 major camera manufacturers, have a whole image processing core dedicated to something called face beautification, which is automatic in-camera Photoshop style removal of your zits and blemishes. I'm not even going to mention cutting edge research like tourist removal, identity replacement, scene carving to expand images, and things like best fits choice. 
I think I need to mention here that this was also a problem with film photography, but people did it in dark rooms. It's only natural that the most common cameras will capture the most images of what is happening, and that these cheap cameras, and, and, and sorry, and that those pictures will one day comprise the archives of our times. And I could say with some certainty that the grass will appear greener than it ever was, and the sky's more blue, and the faces smoother and smiling. And while film photographs age according to the condition of the paper they're printed on, digital photographs may only show age by the fashion of consumer desire, meaning that because a digital image doesn't rot, the only visual signifier of the time it came from will be the processing artifacts of things like this that sell cameras. It means furthermore that if we, if we did it all, we can't trust photos like we might like to. We have to move forward with the understanding that image capture is not the honest recording of a scientific instrument. But don't get me wrong, this isn't an anti-technology tale. Technology is most to blame here. The driving force is consumer desire for a camera that takes a good picture. It's not really an unreasonable thing. And it's a prime example of the many curious ways that technology is absolutely loaded with humanity, fantasy, and failure, right down to the pictures of Waldo that engineers draw in the chips. And it's a stark reminder of the way that democratizing technology can ironically take it further from our personal control. So I sincerely doubt that any of us want to see fewer cameras in people's hands, or that any of us want cameras to become more expensive, especially with their amazing powers. <coughs> And so the way forward is openly acknowledging the nature of cameras and imaging is moving away from reality and towards a kind of illustrative communication. And by that I mean we can no longer tell by the pixel, and the cameras do not operate in a journalistic or truth-telling mode by default. And neither do their duct tape operators, nor did they ever. The success of apps like Hipstamatic and Instagram show us that what people want to say, show, and share about their lives isn't about reality. It's about idealized, prescriptive, or degraded impressions of any moment. And what's really interesting is technology is actually following along with these desires and becoming just as unreliable as our memories. The problem is that this unreliability is not yet explicit. We need to move away from the old camera model, technologically and economically, which was best summed up as, you press a button, we do the rest and make these controls explicit. Now, this work is actually ongoing. To that end, there's an emerging field called computational photography led by Shrey Nayar, Ramesh Raskar, Mark Leboy, Fredo Duran, and Toto Giorgio, which breaks from the traditional camera model and gives us cameras that can do amazing things, like focus a picture after it's taken. But no amount of technology or fancy camera gadgets is going to diminish our collective desire for the truth or for a record that can be trusted. And so additionally, we need to invent tools that help us reconstruct, where possible, what actually happened from what was archived, or at least to tell us how reliable an image could possibly be. And work is ongoing towards tools that tell us that in labs like Haney Breeds, where they do automatic digital forgery detection. We can also expect that some amount of truth is going to come out of these cameras, as opposed to memory, from the collective capture and synthesis of thousands of images, as in Noah Snavely's work, better known as Photosync. I, for one, want only a journalist switch on my camera, which captures with a bare minimum of processing and a maximum of metadata, and shares that image as widely as possible. I also want a small fraction, just a small fraction, of the computational power being spent on zip removal to make my camera take better images of documents. And maybe instead of astroturfing my lawn and faking the color of the sky, maybe that little processor could OCR things for me. Or perhaps the makers of these cameras could just give us some general access to this image processing power. Because as I've learned, you can't totally, you, you, you cannot anticipate what totally awesome things people will do with technology when you give them just a little power over it. So we're sitting right now at the cusp of a, of a great moment. Two years ago, I found out cameras were cheaper than books. And today, the cheapest cameras are cheaper than beer. And furthermore, by, their, by virtue of their cheapness, they are chock full of computational power. 
And as cameras become more capable, the buyers of these cameras should have a basic expectation for access to their capabilities. Taking an unmodified picture, cleanly capturing and processing a document like a book, these should all be baseline expectations for any computational imaging system like the one in your pocket. The raw potential for personal archiving, expression, and information liberation is practically unbounded, provided that these massive image processing engineering efforts can be refocused on things more important than zip removal. And my feeling is that all we need to do is lead by example, showing people how to do more with their cameras so that they will expect that their cameras will do more than take a pretty picture of their lawn, and manufacturers will be forced to oblige. Or if these wants are misguided, at least we can enable them to show us a better future that we never could have anticipated. Thank you.